Dr. Cami Hu. So many of you know Dr. Hu. She is a graduate of our EMIM critical care training program here at the University of Maryland. She is currently the program director for both our EMIM and our EMIM critical care. Cami has been doing a tremendous amount of writing, speaking at not only local, but national conferences, just an outstanding lecturer. In addition, you know, clinically, she splits her time between the medical ICU, as well as the emergency department. And I am so looking forward to having Cami bring us up to speed with her morning masterclass on septic shock. So Cami, the floor is yours. All right. Hello, everybody. Can we, I take it, everybody can hear me okay. Um, thank you for that very nice introduction, Dr. Winters. Um, like you said, uh, my name is Cami Hu. I have the pleasure of spending part of my time in the emergency department and part of my time in the ICU. And I have to say, this is kind of a fun talk because it's sort of like, like you here. know, what I like to do about things. Um, so let's move along. I have no formal conflicts of interest disclosed, but I do have a disclaimer because this is what I think of as sort of personal best practices. Um, that's what I'll be presenting here. And, you know, we're all master resuscitationists. That's our job in the emergency department, or we're at least on our way there uh, in our training somewhere. And um, like I said, these are the things that I think are great. I'm going to throw in some data where it exists. I'll tell you what's my preference, where there's not, and then you can sort of take it away and use it as you see fit on your next shift. So let's start with the case. EMS standard day brings in an altered elderly lady and from her nursing home, she's hypotensive, she's tachycardic, she's tachypnic and she's febrile. Well, this is the talk about septic shock. So there's no secrets here. This patient is in septic shock. Um, and that brings with it a whole bunch of considerations, best things for the patient, current controversies, CMS measures, and all of those other things. Uh, so we, there's a lot for us to go forward and go through as we talk about evaluating and then managing these patients. A key part of evaluation, right? No surprise, the physical exam. Tells us where the infection might be, helps us figure out how sick the patient is, and also helps us figure out other processes that might be at play along with the sepsis that's ongoing. When it comes to finding the source of infection, we know what the usual suspects are. We've got UTI, pneumonia, cellulitis, some sort of intra-abdominal source, and even meningitis. Well, of course, there's other infections we need to consider, but one that we absolutely should not miss is Fourniers. Certainly, if the patient is awake and can tell you that it hurts in that area, it's a place that you'll examine. But if the patient comes in altered, as many of our septic shock patients do, it may not always be readily apparent. A lot of times, these patients are the ones in whom the exam is difficult, the very overweight diabetics who have a lot of extra soft tissue and you can't see that area very easily and require extra hands. So I actually missed this case this once uh, in my uh, past career. And so now it's on my list of things not to forget. I make sure to ask nurses or residents if you're lucky to work with a whole team um, when we're first in the room evaluating while, like, while you have enough hands, help them get them to help you roll or even do like a pseudo lithotomy position, just so you can see what's the sacrum look like? What does the perineum look like? What does the scrotum look like? Once it's cleared, you can move on to the rest of your assessment and evaluation and management. But if you find something, it completely changes the course of where you go with these patients. Um, we also know that delayed recognition uh, and delayed operative management equals worse in mortality. So again, this really changes what we do going forward with these patients. And it's important for us in the emergency department not to miss it. A perhaps more simple part of the exam that of course we all do is the extremity exam. But for me, I find this a very, very crucial part of the exam. Modeling, right, and the skin and the legs tells me that this patient has a high chance of mortality in the next 14 days, and I need to fix this perfusion. It's an endothelial dysfunction primarily, but whatever I can do to mitigate the problem is going to be the best thing for the patient. I wanna know if they're edematous, if they're overloaded. Are they cold? Are they warm? Are they in heart failure, especially in undifferentiated, undifferentiated shock? But in patients who have septic shock, we know that patients can have as many problems as, they, as they'd like to or uh, as their bodies predispose them to. And so you may need to worry about cardiogenic components to your sepsis. What's their capillary refill? It's a very, very simple part of the exam. We know that it indicates poor perfusion, but not only assessing it tells us that the patient is sick, but it also can help us guide our recess efforts. 
which brings us to the Andromeda shock trial. When compared to a resuscitative strategy of no targeting normalization of serum lactate, using cap refill to guide administration of fluid boluses resulted in less organ dysfunction at three days as measured by a SOFA score. Notably, also less fluids administered and a lower mortality were seen in the cap refill group, even though this didn't reach statistical significance. Now the authors presented this as a negative trial, but I would say with lactate clearance being part of the standard of care, finding that something is non-invasive as cap refill did not perform worse uh, is actually quite positive. It doesn't mean throw out your diagnostics, don't throw out the lactate, but use your cap refill alongside it to help guide your care. And you may be able to get away with administering less fluids. And I think especially in resource limited settings, the cap refill is a really clutch tool to have at your disposal um, and can give you real time feedback on your resuscitation as you go back in and check on the patient. Moving on to your diagnostics, of course, we have the basic labs and you know the aforementioned lactate. We've got the rest of the workup down, chest X-ray, EKG, blood cultures, urine cultures. But when I have a patient come in with severe shock, I want a VBG. I'm anticipating some sort of metabolic acidosis, whether it's due to lactate or due to renal failure from this organ dysfunction associated with their shock. And knowing how bad the pH is, as well as how well or how poorly they're compensating from a respiratory standpoint, informs the next steps in my care. We don't give bicarb for all septic shock, but if this patient has a pH of 7.2 or less, they're on three pressors, their bicarb is eight, and they're not making any urine after first re resuscitation steps, they're probably going to be getting some bicarb. Similarly, if they are, you know, the pH is low and their CO2 is abnormally high, too high than it should be for their compensation, it's going to inform me that I need to be worried about impending respiratory compromise. And not only that, but I also need to take specific steps to make sure that I stabilize that patient as much as possible. And I have a backup plan ready to avoid peri-intubation cardiac arrest. We talk about the kidneys. It is my personal preference to have a Foley catheter in patients with true septic shock to really be able to assess the uh, accuracy and the, the um, effect, efficacy of the resuscitation. Um, only in patients with an AKI, but you don't know necessarily ahead of time. Placement of the Foley catheter gives you feedback on your efforts and tells you exactly how you're going. A GFR of zero equals no urine. That's bad. And so this patient's probably also headed for potential bicarb and maybe renal replacement therapy if they don't respond to initial efforts. If they aren't in shock, I at least get a straight cath for urine. Blood cultures and neurosepsis have a 30 to 40% positivity rate. Urine cultures are up to 70%. So really getting a direct culture source is ideal in order to figure out what type of bug you're dealing with. And we know that being able to deescalate your antibiotics going forward is associated with better patient outcomes, less C. diff and decreased mortality. There really is almost no reason not to get a straight cath urine. Um, my residents will tell, me, tell you, I'm like, why haven't we straight cath them yet? Unless you're alert and cogent and uh, talking to me, if you're all, if you're out of it and you haven't given me your urine yet, that order is going in. In addition to our urinary cultures, it's also important to me to obtain sputum cultures. Not necessarily on every single patient, but if their chest X-ray indicates that they have an infiltrate and they've been intubated, you have a direct uh, pathway into their respiratory tract to be able to get a sample. What's worth noting is that the left picture here is a standard endotracheal aspirate. They hook up a sterile inline suction, and then they just kind of get whatever they get sucked up into the mucus trap there and they send it off. What's on the right is a picture of a non-bronchoscopic BAL. This is also called a mini BAL. It's performed through the endotracheal tube. Pretend that you can see an endotracheal tube in this diagram. And what happens is the RT actually instills sterile saline and gets a lower respiratory sample. It can be performed by the respiratory therapist and all the current literature that we have says that this is comparable to a formal bronchoscopic BAL. And it performs better in terms of accuracy in diagnosing specific microbial infections than the endotracheal aspirates. So in my practice for intubated patients, I request that the RT performs a mini BAL. I know these kits may not be available everywhere or your RT staffing may be limited. And if that's the case, then an endotracheal aspirate is just fine. But in these places where they are available, uh, I personally think there really is no reason not to be doing it as we can get better samples than send off direct source uh, cultures at that time.
Finally, we should all have a system in place with our hospital and our lab to directly inoculate ascites fluid into blood culture bottles at the bedside. Standard sampling techniques, where the specimens in a cup and sent down to the lab for them to put in the appropriate media, 33 to 45% positive result rate. And this has been repeated in various studies. Whereas direct inoculation by us into blood culture bottles at the bedside has been repeatedly demonstrated to have higher bug identification rates, up to 90%. This is um, much higher. And again, we already, already talked about how the ability to de-escalate based on identification of your bug and sensitivities is better for patients in the long run. So I know that we all have measures that we have to meet and sepsis bundles and code sepsises, um, but it is really important for patient outcomes if we think about that, that our duty is to the patients and improving uh, their mortality and their outcomes in the long run to really try to get these cultures as soon as we can before we give antibiotics if possible. Moving on to ultrasound. If there is only one thing that you can take away from this talk, in locations where it's feasible, where there's an ultrasound working and available, every patient with shock should have a bedside echo and volume assessment performed as part of their evaluation. The ultrasound can show you how hypovolemic or under the strain the heart is. It can identify pre-existing or acute heart failure. It can give you feedback on the effectiveness of your resuscitation. And we already know that ultrasound is a useful modality if you should decide to use it to identify a variety of infections. On your patient in septic shock, it can identify stress cardiomyopathy or takotsubos, which you'll manage slightly differently or you'll adjust your therapy for. Or it might show you a PE is the source of your fever, shortness of breath, and hypotension. Or alternately, just recognize RV strain from your patient with chronic pulmonary hypertension from untreated obstructive sleep apnea. Patient on the left is going to do much better with IV fluid boluses than the patient on the right. Similarly, we know that a collapsible IVC is generally indicative of fluid tolerance, but a non-collapsing IVC is not necessarily specific for volume overload. This is where we get into some of the fun stuff. If the IVC is plump, especially in scenarios where I'm concerned volume overload exists, like decreased EF or an enlarged RV, I try to do a VEXIS scan. For people unfamiliar with VEXIS, that's okay. It's only been around for a couple of years. The study that created the score pulled from various studies indicating that venous waveforms in the hepatic, portal, and renal veins could predict volume overload, as well as impending AKI in heart failure patients and patients post-cardiac surgery. When the score was studied, grading patients in terms of congestion, severity, a determination of severe congestion by VEXIS correlated with a higher CVP, a higher NT pro BNP, as well as overall fluid balance, and had a 96% specificity for development of subsequent AKI. So it's new, but it's really interesting. And it has lots of implications for us in terms of fluid loading our patients. This is not to teach you about the VEXIS. This is just to sort of show it to you and help you see, you know, the next time you give it a shot or the next time you go look at it, what you're looking for. So the first here is the normal um, pulse waves in, in diagram on the top, and then actual what you'll see on your ultrasound on the bottom. When they're mildly abnormal, perhaps some mild congestion, mild overload, nothing too crazy, you'll start to see a reversal of that systolic and diastolic wave to where the diastolic is now larger than your systolic. When you get severely abnormal and you have lots of congestion, you'll actually see a reversal completely of the S wave where you now see it above the baseline and the diastolic is below. Moving on to the portal vein, again, normal here. You don't have to pay too much attention in, in terms of the numbers, for this go through, but essentially venous should be relatively flat. There shouldn't be very much pulsatility there. Um, you might see a little bit, but it should be pretty much a standard slow monophasic waveform. With a little bit of mild congestion, you start to see a little bit of bumpiness. Um, the difference between that V min and that V max, about 30 to 49%, just a little bit of waves, a little more than you would expect. When you start to have severely abnormal waveforms indicating severe congestion possibly, that those peaks are a lot higher and those valories are a lot lower compared to each other, things that we really shouldn't see. When you identify the renal veins, right, normal venous hum, these are the interlobal veins. So you don't have to find any specific renal vein on your ultrasound. You're just identifying um, the flow on your color Doppler. The venous, the arterial waveforms are at the top there. So you're seeing those nice spikes and the venous waveforms at the bottom. Again, there shouldn't be much pulsatility here. It should be relatively flat. <clears throat> 
mildly abnormal, gives you a little bit more discrete bumpiness in that bottom waveform. So again, the venous being below the baseline. And then severely abnormal, indicating more renal congestion, you start to see really you lose that monophasic flow and you get just that diastolic right at the end of that pulsatility there, very discrete. So when you put all these things together, which is what the VEXIS team did, is they graded based on severity. So you couldn't even come to the party if your IVC was less than two centimeters. So if you start your ultrasound and your IVC is less than two centimeters, you do not go on to do the VEXIS. If you're greater than or equal to two centimeters and you have the rest of them are normal or you have one or two mildly abnormal, you're still indicated as um, uh, mild grade one. Your moderate grade two, if you have one severely abnormal parameter, but your severe congestion, if you have two or more severely abnormal parameters. Caveats to the VEXA scan that the derivation population didn't include those RV failures. So those patients in whom we would presume that the IVC might be plumper due to higher right atrial pressures. Um, it really works best if you can get all of the views. And we know that ultrasound can be limited in some patients. If they're particularly to Kipnik, it may be hard to get a good pulse style wave. Um, body habitus can be difficult. And um, there has no been, not been any actual specific derivation in, um, in sepsis patients just yet. So the way that I like to use the VEXIS is if I see this and I see evidence of congestion in patients who come in and I think that they're septic, if I think that they're dry at all, they'll be getting a smaller amount of fluids, but I'll really be moving to my vasopressors first in terms of augmenting that map to where it needs to be while I sort of figure out how much of the volume overload is at play in terms of their hypotension. Um, if they're not, if I don't think that they're dry at all, then I'll move straight to pressors or inotropy if needed, depending on what the echo looks like and what the rest of their indices look like. All right, moving on to resuscitation. Why do we care so much about the vexus or why do I care so much about vexus? And why do we talk so much about lactates and cap refill? Well, what we know based on all of the studies that have come before is that early goal-directed therapy compared to standard therapy doesn't improve outcomes. But we have seen that an increased fluid balance and volume overload worsens patient outcomes finding a cumulative positive balance worsens mortality with one meta-analysis finding a 20% increase in mortality for every one liter of positive fluid balance at three days. So I really rarely write for 30 mLs per kg. Um, the patient may end up getting it, but I tend to write for smaller boluses depending on the patient. So if it's 250, if it's 500, if it's a liter, I'll write those and I will go back to evaluate the patient and see if they need more. I generally opt for balanced fluid in most cases. I start pressors early and I use a peripheral IV if I don't have time to place a central line or if I don't think it's necessarily gonna be indicated. And I re-ultrasound the patient to see how my interventions are working, but I especially re-ultrasound them if what I'm doing doesn't seem to be improving their maps or their perfusion. And then I add on vasopressin and steroids about when the norepi gets to 0.25 mics per keg per min. We'll talk a little bit more about that. As I've already sort of alluded to, one size does not fit all with fluids. So a standard 33 cc's per kg just isn't going to cut it. And I think we all know that, but it's sometimes hard putting it into practice. You're going to, and you should, do things differently with a frail geriatric patient who has heart failure or the malnourished, chronically ill patient with ESRD than you would with an otherwise healthy adult than you would with a patient with morbid obesity. Older adults tend to have stiffer ventricles as a part of the aging process, which predisposes them to diastolic dysfunction. As they age, they have sclerosis of their nephron, so less of them are functional, and they have a predisposition to AKI as well. They also, of course, as they get older, are more likely to have things like CHF or CKD or ESRD. So in these patients, again, not one size fits all, but in general, these are the ones I tend to give smaller boluses to and reevaluate more frequently. If they need it, if they're dry, maybe they get to the 30 mLs per kg, but sometimes they don't. For average adults, if they're otherwise healthy um, and they don't have concomitant heart failure, they probably could tolerate 30 mLs per kg. I will probably, all things being equal, no comorbidities. They happen to have somehow a raging cellulitis that they got while hiking their you know, 14,000 feet mountain. Um, then I'll probably give them a two liter bolus and reevaluate if they're really hypotensive and they look dry. 
And then for patients who are severely overweight, um, I will say, I don't necessarily do this in all of our obese patients because um, that's a lot of our patient population nowadays. But when you start to get to those higher, higher, more, you know, morbidly obese, um, I don't really have a, a, you know, a minimum BMI. Um, these ones are where I sort of adjust the fluid strategy. As we know, it can be hard to get ultrasound views in them, hard to see their IBC. Um, they're often malnourished, even if they're overweight with comorbidities. And so they have uh, lower albumins and not the best oncotic pressure. Um, so in them, what I'll do is I'll calculate an adjusted body weight. And this is borne out by previous studies that indicate that this is a feasible um, strategy that decreases fluid administration without worsening mortality. Um, and based on that adjusted body weight and predicted need of fluids, I'll give maybe one to two liters at a time, depending on how hypotensive or dry they look, and then reevaluate. So how do we calculate an adjusted body weight? Well, luckily you don't have to do that. There's an MD calc for that. Um, and so you simply plug in their, um, sex, their height and their actual weight, and it will calculate over here in the left corner. It'll calculate an ideal body weight if you'd like, um, but it will calculate an adjusted body weight for you. So for Homer here, if you look 315 pounds is about 143 kgs as compared to an adjusted body weight of 101 kgs, and that's 4.3 liters versus three liters of fluid, which is not insignificant. Um, and so if I can hold off on pouring another liter, liter and a half of fluids into this patient without doing any harm, um, then that's what I'm going to do. And so, um, I recommend if you have an opportunity your next time, give this one a shot. One of the ways that you're going to be able to give these smaller aliquots of fluid and reassess is to augment their map early with early initiation of vasopressors. Multiple studies have demonstrated that you get earlier shock control, that is no need for pressors whatsoever, with hanging norepi earlier. And retrospective studies demonstrating decreases in 30-day mortality when you hang norepi early on. Caveats here are that not all of the studies really quantify early. Some of them are at patient presentation. Some of them are anywhere from one to six hours. Um, depending on how profoundly hypotensive the patient is and how much I think the contribution is because they're intravascularly dry. Um, I don't necessarily start it right away, but if I think that they're more on the less dry side and they're still hypotensive, I start it earlier on, if that makes sense. If I think that they're very dry and they'll be able to get a bolus in really quickly, um, they've got good IV access, then sometimes I'll be able to hold off and see if the fluids by themselves uh, on quick bolus will um, manage their map. But if not, then we just go ahead and start the norepi. I believe Dr. Winters addressed this a little bit already in his talk, the talk about balanced fluids. Um, I think you'll find that those of us who are fans of balanced fluid are still fans of balanced fluid, but uh, without going into the history too much more, if Dr. Winters talked about it already is you know, 2018 came around and the SALT ED trial and SMART came out and said, you know, we're seeing less kidney injury if you use balanced fluids. And then when they actually pulled out sepsis patients in the SMART trial, they started to see some possible outcomes difference in terms of mortality. Well, so 2019 came around and the planned secondary analysis of SMART came out where they looked at balanced versus saline and in patients with sepsis only. And this one seemed really impressive, a lower rate of kidney injury at 30 days or major adverse kidney events at 30 days, more days off pressors, more days off of renal replacement therapy, and a decreased 30 day mortality with the number needed to treat of 20. Seems pretty good. In 2021, the basics trial came around, this randomized controlled trial, very well, um, very well planned and um, executed 11,000 patients and didn't really find a difference in 90 day mortality between primarily plasma light and normal saline. The caveats that some of us will, will mention are that in general, these patients were less sick overall. There were lots of post-surgical patients in a high percentage, somewhere around 40%, I believe that weren't actually um, refractory hypotension. And then there was a good amount of fluid given prior to randomization. So greater than one liter um, and in the uh, lots of crossover. So some of the PLI patients got normal saline and some of the normal saline patients got plasma light. So it may be that that's muddied the waters and why we don't see much difference between the groups. And then the other thing that really um, gets pointed out a lot and I think is important is that there were very small amounts of fluid given 
after randomization. So with the medium of 1.5 liters, um, there, it may be that there really isn't a difference if you're going to administer small amounts of fluids. And to be fair, that's what we're all aiming for the least amount of fluids necessary. Um, but it's worth noting that if you have perhaps the burn patient or, or something else that you're really having to resuscitate hardcore with lots of fluids, there may actually be a difference there. So, um, I will just say that I'm still in the balanced fluids camp, but if I can't get balanced fluids, I'm not devastated about it so much anymore. I've already discussed the use of peripheral vasopressors. If only all of our patients could have veins like this, it'd be so much easier. Um, the data that exists on them, uh, there's no great randomized controlled trials that's multi-center and blinded. Um, but the data that we have indicates that there's a very low event rate. These are all mostly retrospective, a couple of small prospective studies. And it's really major adverse events. Um, and the highest number here is those major adverse events, surgical debridements, DVTs, 0.3 to 2%. Uh, in all patients who get peripheral IVs. Now, again, across these studies, there was some difference between the two in terms of in, in differences across them, but in terms of how long they kept them in, what size the gauge was. But in general, uh, across the board, and if you look at various protocols, including the one at our hospital, they recommend you know a larger gauge that it is above the antecubital fossa that's in for less than 24-ish hours, and in general, recommendation to use more dilute infusions instead of your concentrated pressors. Getting back to ultrasound, right? So we've done all this resuscitation, and we go back and we look and we see, well, the patient's still hypotensive, but they look relatively well-filled. The IVC certainly isn't looking super collapsible, whereas it was earlier, let's say. And so if we're still super hypotensive, what do we go to next? Well, I uh, add on the vasopressin at 0.25 mics per keg per min. Um, our institution actually, because um, of various reasons, um, preferred to start at 0.3, but when the uh, surviving sepsis campaign guidelines came out, I felt like I could bump it down a little bit to sort of mitigate that norepi dosing. And then because uh, by definition for me, adding on vasopressin indicates refractory shock, I add on the stress dose steroids here as well. Moving on to source control. I think we all have um, an idea that we should be using our home antibiograms to um, choose the appropriate broad spectrum antibiotics for true septic shock. Um, in general, just a reminder to use the broad spectrum first. I like to try to get the Zosin or the Meripenem or the Cefepime in um, ASAP because it's gonna cover the most bugs with the caveat, unless for some reason the patient comes in with a culture stamped to their chest that says I have a MRSA infection, then maybe the bank will go in first at that time. Um, one big thing, we've there have been studies, the Empiricus trial looked at giving antifungals to everybody and found no improvement in outcomes, but really we should be thinking about adding a dose of mycofungin for these patients who are on TPN, who have had long-term central access. So this includes your end-stage renal patients, but, but not necessarily all of them. There's no quick and dirty as to how long that can have been in six months, a year. Um, but those extra long ones that come in really sick to consider adding on mycofungin uh, or a kind of candid for them, uh, a breach of GI tract. If you think they've had a perfed bowel, if they've recently had, um, you know, resection and reanastomosis, consider those patients. And then anybody who's really profoundly immunosuppressed, again, that's still somewhat vague, but if you have your, you know, rheumatologic patients who are on you know, an anti-inflammatory um, or a, an immunosuppressant, and they're also on steroids and they happen to be neutropenic. Um, anybody who's that profoundly suppressed and very sick, um, they recommend considering in those as well, especially if they have a known history of yeast pollination. So urinary cultures that continue to grow yeast, um, sputum that continues to grow yeast, those aren't necessarily pathogenic, um, but they're indicative that there may be more yeast on that patient in general. And so they're at risk if they're immunosuppressed. All right. So those are the easy things. And I think all of those things are things you've probably heard before. They're just kind of the way that I like to do things. If it's um, me running the show, moving on to take homes again, this was my big one for the, um, for the beginning cultures change outcomes if they grow something and they grow something the best. If you get them directly from the source. Blood cultures are not the best. There's so much culture negative sepsis that I wonder if we got cultures from the direct source earlier, we'd be able to catch. Um, we'd be able to deescalate those antibiotics, decrease chances of C. diff and improve mortality. So try to get um, samples directly from the source. All patients presenting in septic shock, any kind of shock should get a bedside ultrasound to look at their cardiac function and their volume status. 
fluid resuscitation is not one size fits all. Use your ultrasound findings and early pressers to really get shock control faster and mitigate the amount of fluids you have to give. And then considering it, adding that antifungal coverage in those special populations. Uh, thank you all very much. I don't think I maybe have any time for questions, but I'm happy to take some if they exist. And I actually can't hear anything, so I don't know if what's. All right, thanks so much, Kemi, for giving us some great, really, pearls in terms of septic shock. Those were really outstanding. In terms of getting questions, what I'd like to do is ask those to uh, ask those of you that have questions to go ahead and drop them in the chat. And then at the right. end of our so symposium, what we are going to do is have a focus session, a Q&A session with all of our speakers. So Dr. Bond, myself, will take a look at all of those questions in the chat and then ask them during our end session. Right now, we are up on our very first break. So we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we are going to resume at about 9.05. Let's say be back at 9.05 Eastern Standard Time. And then we're going to hear from Dr. Sutherland, who's going to take us through some of those rare causes. So we, we know sepsis, hemorrhage, hypovolemia, obstructive causes, PE, but what happens when it's not all those things? So we're going to hear some outstanding pearls on rare causes of undifferentiated shock. So take a break, get some coffee, get some additional breakfast. We'll see you back around 9.05.